Calvary Chapel presents Pastor's Perspective, a one-hour program that gives a biblical and pastoral viewpoint on the theological, social, and practical issues of the day. We'll be taking your calls in just a moment. But first, here's today's host. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesday edition of Pastor's Perspective. Yes, Wild Wednesday can only mean one thing. Our wild guest, Pastor Greg Laurie, is here in studio with us to take your questions and calls toll-free across America, one 888 564 6173 If you have questions about what we believe as Christians, why we're Christians, or how to live the Christian life, one 564 6173 And if you want to watch the program and live, live it in color and see Greg and his his disguise you can go to www.kw <laughs> halloween's coming yeah. <laughs> is that no what are you dressed as i am dressed as me wearing a hat wearing glasses okay that's it that's it it's not a disguise that's it's just a, that's a halloween costume well not really but the halloween is coming tomorrow so i yeah, thought i would yeah okay go undercover you're gonna go trick-or-treating probably not but uh we have a lot of candy at church okay. you know we do kind of a alternate celebration and i am gonna dress up on halloween tomorrow you, you told me what you're going to be, but you're going to surprise the people? Well, I'll give a hint. Okay. His theme song would be Under the Sea. <laughs> who would it be, Don Stewart? The, the uh, person whose fish did not like its first taste of religion, right? It's uh, sort of like sushi eating yeah, in reverse. Exactly. Man eats fish. Yeah, exactly. And what is the line that you used when you talked about Jonah? He was what? The original chicken of the sea. And I stole that you line. Did, yeah, but you gave me credit at least. Not so much anymore. No, I know you don't. People you, you, pretty much think it's my... <laughs> That's how it works. But I guess they just give you credit on the radio, That's which okay. is good. You did. That's good. So we're even we're, again. We're even, Steve. The original chicken of the That's sea. That's right. Jonah, yeah, again. So, you know, the way we do it, Don, and is instead of fighting with it and boycotting it, we have like an alternative celebration. We have lots of fun things for the family to do, mm. the kids to come to, food to eat. But then... Uh, we have a you know a presentation of a Bible story Good. and a skit for the kids, uh, and you know we encourage them to you know to walk with the Lord or to know the Lord. So we just sort of take it and use it as an opportunity. Now is this in Riverside or Orange County? This is a both. both. We do a the one in Riverside is gigantic. We call yeah. it Hallelujah Night, mm -hmm. and the one in Orange County. This is maybe our third year, and uh, Jonah will only be appearing in Orange County though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will we be like the two people in history who were actually swallowed by a sea creature and lived to tell the tale in the 18th and 19th century that happened? They were all no hair on their body and yellow color all the way through. Is that going to be the costume? No, no that's, that's it's going to be, but we're working on it. You're working on it. All right. we're, we've all right. got some fun elements and we're going to have a good time with okay. it. And and off we go. So that's in Sunday. Hey, we have yeah. great Sunday. We've got Randy Alcorn coming out. Explain who Randy is. For have those you ever who have, met Randy? No, I haven't. He'd be a great guest. On I'd, I'd like to talk to him. I've read his books yeah. and I've written my own stuff on heaven too. So yeah. I can have uh, some interesting conversations. He's just sort of like an expert on heaven Yeah, and, and on suffering. He's written two yeah, outstanding okay. books on the topic. And so what we do is uh, every now and then I'll have Randy out. Uh, it's been once a year now for the last okay. few years, and we have a biblical discussion, not unlike what we do yeah, here, yeah. where we open up verses, we discuss them, we go back and forth, but uh, you know, he just really is knowledgeable on that topic in particular. I, I would ask him, I'm sure you have, yeah. why did he you know, emphasize heaven as a part of his ministry? In other words, why did he pick that topic yes. to be part of his... You know, That's one of the questions I'll come. I think I mean know the reason yeah. to oh. it. Uh, I think it's uh, partly due because he's a diabetic, so he's had that challenge oh, through life. Okay. But but even more, um, I, I think that he, you know, he was really active in uh, protesting abortion and abortion clinics, mm. and a lawsuit was filed against him, and they got, his, got hold of his... Uh, finances in the sense where you know they they, really? they want a, a huge settlement Ooh. so because of that he's had to live a very simple kind of a life and you know he uh it has a ministry called eternal perspective ministries and what mm. i like about randy is he always brings that eternal perspective Good. but not in a in a way that's like restrictive and harsh but really hopeful and encouraging good you good. know just always keep the eternal perspective on whatever it is you're doing and i, I really appreciate that you know and when you've had a huge loss or you're yep. dealing with a disability or you have a great struggle in life i'll tell you what that hope of heaven the biblical teaching on heaven can really lift you because as paul tells us in colossians yeah. 3 set your mind on things above mm -hmm. not on things of the earth uh, you know really getting that heavenly look at things indeed okay so randy alcorn on sunday and tomorrow night only in orange county jonah will show up um, yes. dressed as Greg Laurie, and then in, in Riverside... Uh, He's going to sing, even. He is. 
that we've on rewritten key? the lyrics to. Really? Yes. Uh, he's going to Then do you'll it. be lip syncing, right? No, okay. he's, he's going to sing. I can speak for him. <laughs> and he's going to do new lyrics to Under the Sea. Really? Biblical style. Under the Sea. Yeah. All right. And they were written by professional musicians. Okay. Well, okay. You heard that. You <laughs> heard it me. For, you heard it first here, people. Okay. That's that's uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night. Uh, what time does it start? Uh, five o'clock. Oh, it's an early one. Yeah, early. Because you got all the, the Halloween stuff. So now do the kids come dressed in costume? Yeah, they you do. You want to do? Okay. Uh, but biblical costume. We encourage or, or, or that. Anything or? We encourage okay. that. But you know, okay. every now and then a, a, a princess sneaks through. That's okay. And we don't stop them from coming. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, okay. How about that? Uh, that sounds good. How about that tribute to Chuck? Yeah, and I was going to ask. You, that was wonderful. 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 I mean, yeah. uh, we had not only what fourteen, fifteen thousand show up, but Brian, something like four hundred different venues yeah. were watching it simulcast. Do you have any idea at the total people? Somewhere I read the number eighty thousand. Yeah. I don't know where that came from, but yeah. but I wouldn't be surprised yeah. because you know we sort of laid the track for this with Harvest America. Our churches have the equipment and the ability to take the signal. So we just, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to get the word yeah. up, but we let everybody know yeah. we're going to webcast this thing. It was shot in HD, yeah. and uh, a lot of churches took advantage. I know our church was mm-hmm. packed, or not packed, but a lot of people. I know Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa was full. Mm-hmm. I know many churches around the country, around the world were watching. Of course, uh, people were watching on their computers as well. So, you know, that's fantastic that we could all participate in this tribute and, and we felt at this stage mm. that we wanted to celebrate a life yeah. you know and uh and so you had all that music going back to the earliest days with love song and mustard seed faith and parable and mm-hmm. malcolm and Allen was a real treat for me yeah and then you know jeremy kemp and phil wickham and evan wickham and so it was it was a really wonderful thing and then hearing from a bunch of the pastors tom stipe from the old mm. tent days here at calvary and don mcclure and and uh bob coy and uh i was able to bring a message it was a great privilege so it was quite a night and people came to christ too they did they did and uh wonder it was a wonderful night four hours long but it didn't seem like four hours yeah it's it didn't you know and it was long yeah but i mean if ever there was a time to go over and to, you know it this is a one-time event exactly it's not something you rush through this is a life that has impacted all of us pastor mm-hmm. chuck and impacted the world so I thought it was entirely appropriate. Yeah, and so uh, bravo to you at Harvest for putting it together, Greg. All the graphics—that well, was fabulous. We helped, you, guys you know. Did. It was a team effort yeah. with Harvest and Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. We were happy to share the ammo, as we say, mm-hmm. and work together for the kingdom. And I love to collaborate with other people, other ministries. And uh, so that was fun. We enjoyed it. It will look very, very professional. And so um, praise the Lord for that. And I'm sure Chuck uh, somewhere is smiling if he heard the news <laughs> about that. And then, then he would say, of course, to all of us, okay, let's get on with the ministry, guys. You yeah. know, everybody report for duty, all hands on That's deck. Right. right. Okay, you ready to take questions? No, I have to go now. Okay, get out of here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you, let Jonathan, you can sit there. He's here. And, He's and, here. Uh, Grady, is that right? No, this is Chad. Chad, I, I knew it was something like, Chad. Chad from, you want to introduce him? Yeah, this is Chad Williams. Okay, and, hi, and Chad. Chad is one of our intern pastors. Chad has an amazing story. He was a Navy SEAL. Really? Yeah, served our country. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, he shares the story. In fact, a lot of times on news programs, uh, he's been being brought in, you know, CNN wow. or whoever else you know and they're talking any issue involving seals the a lot of times called chad but the cool thing about chad is he will always use it as an opportunity to share the gospel all right well good for you chad uh we'll have to have him on as a guest sometime he individually. would be a very good guest okay and he'll tell you some amazing stories and he's a bold street evangelist oh great well praise mm-hmm. the lord and of course your son jonathan jonathan immediately Lurie. to your left right yes. here okay got it all right well they're in studio with pastor greg and myself so even though he's not ready we're going to start giving greg questions on wild wednesday here because okay. that, that's why he's sitting here not just to show us his halloween outfit all right so uh, <laughs> let's go to the phones now and hit john from Reno valley first on wild wednesday on pastor's perspective hi john welcome to the program Oh, great. Always a pleasure to, to call in and talk to you, pastors. Thank Pastor you. Greg, Pastor Don. Hey there. Well, it sounds like it's more like Wacky Wednesday <laughs> instead of Wild Wednesday. <laughs> well, you call them as you see them. We won't dispute right, that. <laughs> right, right, right. Hey, well, listen, before I ask you to address my question, a quick comment to, to Pastor uh, Greg. Hey, Greg, I've been a member of your church for a lot of years, and I attend your men's uh, Bible study on Tuesday mornings. And mm-hmm. I just want to give a shout-out to Pastor Brad. He oh. does such 
a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And the mm. guys that he has leading our groups, especially Larry, they do a terrific job. Right. I just want to thank you for having thank him. Thank you very much for the, saying that. He's probably listening look, right now, so okay. appreciate that. <laughs> But I just want to tell the, the male audience out there, if you're not part of a men's fellowship yeah, like this, we you're really missing that. out. Oh, oh, wow. really true. The rewards, really true. the fellowship, yep. it's invaluable. So if mm-hmm. you're not involved in one, take a look at one. Yes. Good. Well, my, my question is, um, Jesus asks his disciples, whom do people say that I am? And right. one of the names that pops up that kind of confuses me is they say John the Baptist. Well, the two of them walked the earth at the same time. So what would possess someone to confuse the two or say that Jesus is now John the Baptist, you know, or that, is it just a misinterpretation? I don't know. It's, 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 it. it's an excellent question, because uh, Herod, when he heard the miracles of Jesus, thought John, people would say John had risen from the dead, and then, right. of course, uh, Herod said, John, I behead. Uh, Greg, what do you think it was about you know John and Jesus? Because this tells us a lot about Jesus and his character when we compare it to John the Baptist. What do you draw from that? Well, of course, they were related, mm-hmm. and John was the forerunner of Jesus, and John was sort of like the last of the Mohicans. Mm -hmm. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, Jesus said of him, of men born of women, there is not a greater than John the Baptist. But his role was very simple. It was to point Mm -hmm. people to Christ. Now, coming to John and Herod, they had an interesting relationship because King Herod seemed to have a respect for John, Mm -hmm. but he did imprison him. And uh, but you know it would seem that Herod was somewhat influenced by John, but not enough. You know, and uh, one day uh, Herodias, Herod's wife, had her daughter Salome uh, do a seductive dance for Herod, and in a drunken stupor, he said, "I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom." Uh, Salome goes to mom. Mom says, "I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter." So they behead John, and then later on, uh, when Jesus is out ministering. Herod says, this is John risen from the dead. You know, I think Herod heard more from John after he was dead than when he was alive. Indeed. Because he had a guilty conscience. Mm. And, of course, it wasn't John risen from the dead. It was Christ, uh, who John was the forerunner of. But it, it tormented Herod, and and he was a wicked man, and he had a wicked son, and he had a wicked grandson, and he passed it on for generations. That would be my perspective no, on it. That's good. You know, it, it's interesting because the great multitudes did ne- never saw Jesus and John the Baptist in the same place. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus came and was baptized at one particular time. John was out there at the, the Jordan River. But there was something about Jesus that reminded them of John, mm-hmm. which tells us something about his character. He wasn't a wimpy guy, was he, Greg? Because no. John the Baptist was a rugged individual. I mean, he told it like it was. Yeah. And so in Jesus' character, it, we, we've got that about him. So he was reminiscent of John in many, many ways of his of, of his character, his demeanor. Right. or his ministry, maybe even physical presence. You know, to put it in the vernacular, John was kind of like a rock star in his day. Yeah. Before Christ came, he was like the man. Yep. You know, think about this, 400 years of silence, no mm-hmm. miracles, no angelic appearances, and seemingly out of nowhere, but according to God's schedule, burst this crazy guy, not crazy, I mean crazy in a good way, mm-hmm. this amazing Elijah kind of like character, you know, preaching to repent, the people to repent, fearless and not intimidated by anyone. And a lot of people followed John, but his ministry was relatively short-lived. You know, he even had his own disciples. But when he saw Christ, he said to his disciples, behold the Lamb of God, you know, who takes away the, excuse me, that's what the father said. Mm-hmm. He, he told his disciples to follow Christ. You know, this is the Lamb of God. Follow him. Like, my work is done. Now you guys follow him. I've done my part. And, you know, that's pretty amazing that he would have that kind of fame and that kind of effect and then would be able to step down and realize his job was done. But, you know, we all have a job to do, and it's not unlike what John was called to do. It's to point people to Christ, as John said of Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. Yeah, you took my line away. Sorry. The end. That was, that's okay. That's Great fine. Great minds think alike. They do. But you know what's also <laughs> interesting? Um, we can go now in Israel to the most likely place where John the Baptist baptized mm-hmm. Jesus. And folks, that's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So when you see people coming from Jerusalem, Judea, all around, he had to be a rock star to get people out to that mm-hmm. direction. You had to be somebody special. You had to have something about you that yeah. was believable. And the masses did believe John. The sinners, the Romans even were, were baptized many of the religious leaders there because he spoke with authority so by mm. comparing jesus to john the baptist mm. you see that jesus spoke the same type of authority obviously and mm. greater than, than john so a lot of things in common that they they did have yeah great question john from marino valley okay let's go now to jamie from beechwood new jersey next on this uh, why uh, 
I don't want to say wacky, Wild Wednesday on Pastor's Perspective. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. Welcome okay. to the program. <laughs> Hi. How are you? It's so nice to speak to you, and I just love Greg Laurie. I listen to him every day. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Don, too. I really enjoy your show, and I was very fortunate to speak with Dr. Um, Chuck Smith, Pastor oh, Smith. Wonderful. And it was just wonderful. Wonderful. Now, Jamie. my question is, why did God name Jacob Israel? Yeah, okay, that's a good question, Pastor Greg. God did name Jacob the supplanter, the heel yeah. catcher. He changed his name to mm-hmm. Israel after the night of wrestling. Why do you think that was? Well, you know, Jacob was an interesting character. Mm-hmm. Uh, his brother was Esau. Mm-hmm. And uh, normally, the firstborn would take the birthright and and sort of be the spiritual leader in their tribe. But in this case, God reversed it. And uh, so uh, Esau was born first. His name meant Harry, literally Harry. Uh, Jacob, Yaakov, heel catcher, hanging under his brother's heel. They were womb mates, you could say. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, but, you know, here's the problem. God promised to Jacob that he would give him the blessing, but Jacob was not satisfied to let God do his work in his way. So he connived mm-hmm. and manipulated and even fooled his father Isaac, who was getting old and his eyesight was fading, mm-hmm. to give him the blessing. It's almost a comical story because mm-hmm. he covers himself in yep. animal skins, makes the venison like his brother used to make, and and that shows you how hairy Harry must have been mm-hmm. to have an animal skin on and have dad think, yeah, that that's my son, smells like my son, it <laughs> feels like my son. But, you know, he, he got the blessing. Well, Esau was ticked off at him. And so fast forward, and then Jacob kind of meets his match and Laban, his uncle, who's, is, you know, as conniving as he is. But then we fast forward to the scene where Jacob is wrestling with this angel. Mm-hmm. It's kind of my opinion, Don, see what you think, but I think that was a Christophany. It very well could be. Yeah, because yeah. he's wrestling with this angel uh, at a place called Peniel. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, he says, uh, I've seen God face exactly. to face. Mm-hmm. So that's why I thought it was a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. But, you know, he, they start out fighting, and the angel or the Lord touches him where, where he can't fight anymore. It's almost like wrestling with a kid, a child. You let them get the advantage, but they never had the advantage. It went on and on. And Jacob went from uh, cunning to clinging, mm-hmm. from resisting to resting. And then finally at the end, instead of fighting with this messenger, mm-hmm. be it the Lord or an angel, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And God changes his name because mm-hmm. he's a new guy now. He's learned his lesson. He's gone from the heel catcher to Israel, which I think means ruled by God, but yes. you're the scholar. Yeah, yeah, it's something long like that, governed by God, right. prince of God, ruled by God, yeah. And what is interesting, though, he he taught his kids well, because when they did the uh, story with Joseph, when they killed the animal and put the mm-hmm. blood on that, it was the blood of an animal that fooled their father, as their yeah. father had fooled That's his true. father. So what goes around comes around. So they learned that part right. of his nature, too. But at the end of the day, he made that great uh, those great pronouncements in Genesis 49, yeah. the prophecies of each of the sons. And, That's right. Uh, so he did be Become a prince of God, one governed by God. And so we talk about, you know, the children of Israel, the children right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but yep. the children of Israel, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and that's yep. and it's we talk about the God of Abraham, right. Isaac, and Jacob. You know, yep. so yep. he he made it, man. He I mean did. he, he did. It, it gives hope to those of us who yeah. have failed mm-hmm. and God forgives and God restores. And and he mm-hmm. has such a significant role and we still cite him today. And yeah. uh so he was a fascinating character and a man of God. You know, Greg, I had a professor in Bible school who used to say, like, characters like Jacob, you know, if God could use a person like Jacob, maybe mm-hmm. he could use someone like you and someone like me. And That's I like it. that. You know, yeah. we, we we take heart from Jacob, don't we, That yeah. uh, whom God uh, used. All right. Uh, great question there, Jamie, from Beachwood, New Jersey. Let's come back west to, uh, oh, no, let's go to Bangor, Bang. Let's go further east and north here, uh, further north anyway. And Barry is with us. Hi, Barry. Welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hello. Uh, thank you for... Uh Thank you for the information that you present to people through the gospel. You're welcome. Thank you for calling. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, I understand that the Holy Spirit will teach different people, different paths of Scripture, because we get a mindset and we can't see the other part of something we ought to be able to see. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the reason I'm talking to you people. I'm talking about Christ descending into heaven. Mm-hmm. In John 27, 20, 27, mm-hmm. Uh, remember Thomas, he said to Thomas, reach your hand and put your fingers into this hole mm-hmm. on my side. In John twenty seventeen, mm-hmm. he tells Mary, mm-hmm. don't touch me because I haven't ascended to my father yet. Mm-hmm. Then in Luke twenty four fifty one, mm-hmm. 
disciples are standing there in looking handle, up at right. heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So can you explain to me, <laughs> didn't he ascend into heaven twice? Or, or give me an understanding which I don't have yet. Okay, Acts chapter 1 is the answer, right, Greg? Well, I'm kind of thinking about these different appearances and how he dealt with them. But go ahead. Yeah, you have a thought there. talks about for 40 days he appeared to mm-hmm. them he, on and off. In, yeah. I mean, 10 different appearances of, of the resurrected Christ yeah. in Galilee, right. in Jerusalem, this and that. So uh, what happened, Barry? He came, you know, he went, he left, he came back for 40 days. He ate mm-hmm. with them. He would leave. He would appear and disappear. So he didn't ascend, you know, at the end of the 40 days, he ascended once and for all. But mm-hmm. he did, uh, you know, appear at different times. Great. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about these different appearances, like on one occasion he says, touch me, another occasion, don't touch me. Um, You know, John 20, when Mary Magdalene comes to the empty tomb wanting to anoint his body, excuse me, she didn't really. Right. She she didn't know where he was. She didn't know what was going on. So Jesus appears. She thinks he's the gardener. And uh, and then he says her name Jesus or Mary, Mm -hmm. rather, and she recognizes him and she grabs him and he says, touch me not. For I have still yet to ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Now that phrase, touch me, could be translated, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, um, uh, Don, I'm calling you the wrong name, John. That's okay. Speaking from John. Uh, cl- don't cling to me. Mm. And, you know, there's different ways you can interpret that. Like, I kind of wonder, you know, was he saying in effect, Mary, things are going to change now. It's a whole new covenant. Uh, you don't hold on to me in that way you used to physically. I'm now going to live inside of you. Or was it, wow, you've got a death grip on my ankle, girl. Let go. It hurts now. Uh, you know, so probably uh, the first one, not the second. But but then kind of contrasting that with Thomas, mm-hmm. where he says, go ahead and put your hand on my side. Because Thomas was saying, you know, I'll believe if I could touch the wounds mm-hmm. in his hands and so forth. And so it's just different people. And God deals with different people in different ways. There was nothing mystical about his mm-hmm. body. He ate fish. He spoke with a voice. He was still physical. He bore in his body the marks of the crucifixion. However, he could appear in a room without using the door, which he didn't do previously, yeah. and uh, and so forth. And so it, to me, it's just he dealt with different people who were coming at him from different perspectives. Maybe to Mary, he was saying, it's a new covenant. I'm going to live inside of you. Don't cling to the old way. To Thomas, he was saying, go for it. And by the way, Thomas didn't need to go for it. Mm-hmm. He just said, my Lord, oh my God. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, there's another way of looking at it, and that is, this is the day of his resurrection, uh, Easter Sunday, mm-hmm. and she she uh, is holding on to him, yeah. and he's saying, I have not yet ascended to my Father. In other words, I will be around for a while. Mm-hmm. So he's going to be around for 40 days, so you don't have to hold him one time here like this mm-hmm. is the last time you're going mm-hmm. to see him. So that's another possible that's a good way one. I thought of, of, that. of looking at that, like that. Because for 40 days, he continued to show himself appearing and disappearing, and so, in other words, Mary was going to see him again. So this is not, yeah. in other words, you know, you can imagine, Greg, you yeah. see the resurrected Christ. I'm going to grab him now. Never might, let him go. Yeah, never let him. This You're might, not getting away from yeah, me this time. This might be my last chance. Yeah. And so maybe that's what's going on there, yeah. too. Could be. That's yeah. a good thought yeah. there. Okay. But uh, now. You shouldn't be a host of a radio show. <laughs> I thought about doing that one time. <laughs> you could be a guest, too, maybe. <laughs> We'll see. All right. Great question there. We appreciate that. Barry from Bangerman. Let's go all the way back here, the West Coast, Southern California, and Rory from Los Alamitos. Rory, thanks for your patience. You are on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for taking my call, Pastors. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question for Pastor Greg regarding the emergent church. Mm-hmm. How how can I recognize it? Is there um, any referrals as far as reading material? Um and can you just explain what that is, what the emergent church okay. is? Okay, the emergent movement, Pastor Greg. Boy, I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to say here's a really good book to read on it. I'm sure there are some good books to read on it, but I don't know of any. Do you, Don? Did he come to mind? Um, there was one that Don Carson wrote a few years ago okay. on that that, um, that was pretty good on that. Um, here's the problem, though. Mm-hmm. It, it seems to keep emerging and changing, though, doesn't yeah. it? That's So it's hard to pin something down is right. one of the problems I got. Well, I think that... I wonder if people even know yeah. what this term means. It seems like it gets thrown around yeah. a lot. You know, I think if you you take what I perceive as the emergent church, first of all, I don't think it's a, a big threat to the church right now, but uh, but I think it's out there. And to me, emergent is just a new word for liberal. Mm-hmm. A liberal is someone that would come and not accept the scripture as a sole authority that they base things on. And, and effectively, the emergent philosophy, emergent church, if you will, would, would be people that are more liberal in their Bible interpretation 
and maybe even more liberal, not only theologically, but even in their political views. But um, it's just, to me, a deviation from the Scripture. And I think sometimes that people will sort of get this idea of a boogeyman called the emergent Mm -hmm. church, and I don't know if what they're even thinking is the emergent church is emergent or liberal. So I guess it would depend on what they're talking about in particular. Do you have something in mind you're thinking of, or is Rory offline? No, no. It's kind of like old, like you said, old-fashioned liberalism, which kind of had a big tent. It wasn't just the Christians that were part of the uh, redeemed. They took in people who were non-Christians. Even um, Pope Francis seems to even put atheists now in in the kingdom of heaven Mm -hmm. as it is. So not only you have Muslims and other religious people, even some non-religious ones, and uh, the emergent movement started as a, as a conversation. They said asking mm-hmm. questions. That's it. Here's the difference: the Bible gives answers, yes. and we go to the Bible for answers. We have a lot of questions. It has the answers, so that's right. you know that's where we go to. And uh, unfortunately, some of the people in the so-called movement have been playing fast and loose with the scriptures, what they say. Uh, they become universalist, teaching that mm-hmm. everyone will end up in heaven. Yeah. You, you know, Greg, when someone says that, I always ask the question: Well. Jesus is called the Savior. You got to be saved from something, right? I mean, exactly what, right. What are they saved from? Yeah, that's right. And you're you're really tempering with the essential yep. doctrines of the Christian faith. Yep. And uh, it, you know, if you're a universalist, if you believe that everyone gets to heaven eventually, then you know that is one of the greatest insults I think you could level at God. Yeah. And against Jesus Christ, because why would Jesus have suffered and died and borne the sin of the world Mm. if all roads effectively led to God? And it is that sort of conversation. But look, you know, when I get into the pulpit, I merely stand as a representative of God Almighty. And and the Bible is an authoritative book. The Bible is Mm. a book that gives us clear answers. And I think it needs to be delivered in that way. Yeah, and, and the whole idea of, of Jesus talking about Judas Iscariot said mm-hmm. it better he'd never been born, the first chapter of the book of Acts, that after he died, he went to his own place. Mm-hmm. That doesn't sound like heaven, does it, Greg? No, he was judged, and yeah. there is a hell, and yeah. if we don't speak of hell, we're not giving the whole gospel. I mean, the word gospel means good news. Yeah. Well, I can't fully appreciate the good news until I first understand the bad news. Yep. The bad news is we've broken God's commandments, we've fallen short of God's standards, and if we've committed one sin, and everyone has done that and mm-hmm. far more, uh, we're guilty of all of the law, and the Bible says that we will face a certain judgment. Mm-hmm. Here comes the Savior now, who has stood in our place, died in our place, absorb God's wrath in our place, and if we'll turn from our sin and believe in him, we can be forgiven. That's the gospel. If we merely offer Jesus as an additive to a life, hey, he'll make your marriage a little stronger and you give you a little more spring in your step and your teeth a little whiter, whatever, (laughs) that's not gospel preaching. That's I don't know what that is, but it's not the gospel. So I think we need to give the whole counsel of God. We're not in a place to edit out what's uncomfortable or politically incorrect or awkward. We have to deliver the goods. Yeah, he who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5 5 says, became a sin offering for us. He became the penalty of the sins of the world were placed upon him. The judgment was placed upon him. He took it. But we can only receive that free gift of God, which is eternal life, by reaching out and taking it. He won't shove it down our throat. He says, here it is. And uh, the question is, have you taken it? Greg, there are people out there listening to you. You I'm so glad you asked that. I was just going to say, I I would just almost be certain there are people listening, eavesdropping on our conversation maybe, who are not yet a Christian. And I would just say to you right now, would you like to become a Christian? Mm. Would you like Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior and Lord? And would you like to have the assurance from God that you will go to heaven when you die? Listen, I'll lead you in a prayer. Then we can talk about this prayer later, Don. But I'll lead you in a simple prayer. And if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want your sin forgiven, pray this prayer wherever you are after me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And I turn from that sin now, and I put my faith in you and you alone. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be my God and my friend. From this moment forward, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And after the break, you can explain what all that's about. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Greg, for that wonderful. All right, this is Pastor's Perspective. It is the Wednesday edition. Greg and Lori Don Stewart taking your calls. one 564 6173 is the toll-free number. We'll be back in a couple of minutes, so stay right with us.
Have you ever seen a person who was once enslaved to an addictive lifestyle and then all of a sudden they came to know Jesus as their savior and they're like a different person? They're happy, they're excited about life. They've become transformed. If you or someone you know has an addiction, whether it be to drugs or alcohol, even prescription drugs, an eating disorder, or a problem with gambling or pornography, I'd like to recommend this year's One Step to Freedom conference on DVD entitled High Time. Hear guest speakers Mike McIntosh, Jerry Brown, Tommy Cota, and testimonies by Evo Elder and Hannah Parks. I can, I can only imagine what this guy's face was just like, like, wow, you set me free. And Jesus just smiling down at this man as he's been set free. To order a copy of this year's conference for a friend or loved one, call the word for today at 1-800-272-WORD or visit us online at thewordfortoday.org. Trick or treat! Pastor Chuck and Don Stewart have released an informative DVD entitled Halloween, Innocent Fun or Spiritual Deception. This DVD will educate and equip you with helpful information about Halloween to defend the faith. To order this Halloween DVD hosted by Pastor Chuck and Don Stewart, call the word for today at 800-272-WORD or visit us online to watch a preview at thewordfortoday.org. KWTH Barstow, Las Vegas, KWDS Kettleman City, AM 660 and 102.5 KWBE Oil Dell Bakersfield, the K-Wave Radio Network. And we're back with you with the second half of the Wednesday edition of Pastor's Perspective with our special regular guest on Wednesday, Pastor Greg Laurie. I'm Don Stewart, taking your calls toll-free across America at one 564 6173 When we're out the break, Greg and I had an interesting discussion. Greg, uh, wouldn't it be great if every Wednesday when you were here, we had a time where the gospel could be preached, an invitation was given for sinners to come to Christ? Yes. I love that. Then it will really be wild Wednesday. It will be wild, Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, that's a great idea. We were just talking about that and uh, after we talked to the last caller. Mm-hmm. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if you could know that every Wednesday, when you tune into Pastor's Perspective, that's mm-hmm. when I'm a guest with Don, that you could know that we would throw the net. By that, I yeah. mean there would be a opportunity that we would give for people to believe in Jesus Christ. You could tell your non-believing friends to tune in. You know, I know that you all know that Don is a scholar. He knows the Bible very well. But Don really is is really gifted as an apologist, which is, you know, t- define apologist, Don. An apologist is one who gives a defense, a mm-hmm. reason to believe. First uh, Peter three fifteen uh, to every man an answer you yeah. give with the faith, the hope that the faith that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence we're told to give. And so an apologist basically, right. uh, people attack the faith, categorizo. They make an accusation mm-hmm. yeah. in the old Athenian courts, and the apologist gives the response, the defense. Yeah. yeah so. Don's an apologist, and I'm an evangelist, so it's a good team. Yeah. Because we each have something that we do. It's a little different than the other thing, but it's all moving toward the same goal. And so you could say to your non-believing friends, hey, call in yeah. and uh, you know ask your questions, and then you could know. Because I think a lot of times people, Don, people listen in, they never call. Lots of people listen yeah. and don't call. Maybe they listen in to eavesdrop in our conversation. They think Christians are crazy. Fact of the matter is... Uh, the first time I heard the gospel, I sat close enough to a group of Christians on my high school campus to hear what they were saying. The last thing I intended on doing was converting. But mm-hmm. there are people listening because this signal goes all around yep. the Southern California, throughout the United States, on the Internet, globally. There are people listening. So if you could know that we'd throw the net on Wednesday and invite people to Christ, 
I think we could see some amazing results. Yeah, I think so, too. And, you know, over the years, Greg, we've heard stories of people who just happen to be changing Mm -hmm. the channel, happen to be listening to the radio, just Mm -hmm. happen to pass by just to stay awake sometimes. You know, when it rebroadcasts like an early morning and the Lord convicted them, they came to Christ. And so you never know. You never know who's listening. And so uh, we'll try and do that every Wednesday. In fact, we'll make a point to do it every Wednesday. That's part of the Wild Wednesday of, of giving evidence for faith, reasons to believe, then a clear presentation of the gospel. Amen. All right. Sounds good. All right, let's. Oh, here's going to be a fun one, Greg. Let's go back to the phones. Caleb from Hemet, California. Hi, Caleb. Hi, Welcome Caleb. to Pastor's Perspective. Hello, Caleb. You're on the air. Go ahead. Um, was Satan cast out of heaven before the earth was made or after the earth was made? Okay, great question, Caleb. Okay, Pastor Greg, Satan cast out of heaven, or maybe he means was, did Satan sin and rebel against God yeah. uh, before God created the universe, or was it after uh, or before, you know, after the, he created the universe? Well, it would have to be before, because he's already in a fallen state, coming in the form of a serpent and enticing Eve. Mm-hmm. And we know that he once was a high-ranking angel, Lucifer, son of the morning, spoken of Isaiah 14. Then we read about him, of course, in the book of Job, appearing with the angels and so forth. And so uh, he rebelled against God. He led one-third of the angels with him that we believe are demons today. So presumably that happened before the temptation in the garden, wouldn't you think, Todd? Yeah, it, it seems to be a better answer than mm-hmm. than saying he his fall. Some people argue his fall was in Genesis three when he came and, and you know and be in the form of a serpent, but it doesn't seem to be mm-hmm. uh, that way. And we're not told specifically that, mm-hmm. Caleb. But what is interesting, he wasn't actually cast out of heaven at that time. He mm-hmm. was cast out of God's presence. That's it. Continually, but he had limited access as in Job. He, right? He does. In fact, he still he, does. He has limited access, and there he is in his role as the accuser of the brethren. Yeah. And what is he doing there in the book of Job? He's accusing Job. God brags on Job. Have you considered my servant Job, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil? And Satan's response is, you know, loose paraphrase, oh, give me a break. Yeah. Job, you know, fears you because you give him all that cool stuff. And later on he says, oh, please, skin for skin, all that a man has will he give for his life. So the Lord allowed the enemy to bring calamity into Job's life. But You know, he is the accuser of the brethren and still is the accuser of the brethren. In fact, in Revelation, Mm -hmm. uh, that phrase is referred to again. Remember that one? Yeah. That, you know, the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Exactly. And how did they overcome him? You remember this. By the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Revelation chapter 12. And the word of their testimony. And the word of their testimony. And they live not their lives to the death. That's right. So, you know, I think we can probably find some takeaway truth in how we can overcome the accuser of the brethren there. Yeah, and and the good news is that uh, he will eventually go, his career is down, Caleb, from Mm -hmm. the presence of God to limited access. uh, Revelation 12, as Greg mentioned, the great tribulation cast down to earth into the abyss, the uh, bottomless pit, when Christ comes back and then he's released for a short time, then to the lake of fire, Mm -hmm. a career that goes south from beginning to end. And and Greg, it didn't have to be, did it? It was something he chose. This is important to understand. Yeah, he chose it. This being chose to be that. And why he did it, yeah. It's hard to say, but we, we know his motive was, yeah. you know, he says, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend up on high. I will be like God. And, you know, you, you think about the fact that here he was access to the, the very presence of God, and then he still rebels, and those angels as well, and, and they fell. But here's a weird thing to think about. Why does God allow Satan to exist? Well, one answer may be there are times when Satan actually serves the purposes of God. Indeed. And it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that. But, I mean, here's an example of it. At the at the cross of Calvary, both Satan and God were moving effectively in the same direction. Mm-hmm. But they had different goals. They both knew Jesus had to die. Satan wanted him dead to stop him. God wanted Jesus to die and atone for the sin of the world to please the Father to bruise him. And uh, so the the worst thing imaginable— the, the greatest travesty maybe in human history that happened, the mm. death of Jesus, who was completely innocent, brought about the greatest good because our salvation was purchased at the cross. So the point of it is is sometimes when the devil's attacking, we think, why would God allow it? But I find that it will sort of show what you're made of. Mm-hmm. You know, God won't let us be tempted above what you are able, but what would the temptation make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it? First Corinthians 10, 13 says, so, you know, 
the devil has to ask permission, as we see in the book of Job. Yep. God won't just let him run amok in our life. So he can, if we're really a believer, we'll cling to the Lord, we'll hang on to God, and we'll resist it. But if we're not a believer or or we're really not even seeking to walk with the Lord, we'll capitulate and cave in quickly. So it can be a way to cause you to depend on God even more. Indeed. So as Greg said, he is the accuser of the brethren, of course, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Pentecostals, too. He accuses everybody who calls on the name of Christ. Okay, bad joke. Okay, Caleb from Hammett, California. Oh, I get it, brethren, got, the denomination. You got it, you got it. Yeah, a little wow. slow there, Greg, getting the joke, but maybe it wasn't that <laughs> Wait good. Wait a second, sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Caleb back. <laughs> Caleb's not laughing. Okay, Caleb from Hemet, California. He's like, what are they talking yeah, about? Yeah, he doesn't get it. Okay. <laughs> Caleb, the young man. Can you tell us your age, if you don't mind, Caleb? Excellent question. Uh, seven. You're seven. Well, great question, Caleb. Thank you so much for calling. And again, Greg, we love it when these young ones yes. call and ask because he's thinking, okay, I see Satan cast out or he's in the Garden of Eden. Well, when did that happen? That happened before, after. I mean, everything was very good and perfect when yeah. God created. Where did this character come sure. from? And uh, excellent, excellent question, Caleb from Hemet. Please call back again. All right. Uh, Mike from 29 Palms. Been waiting forever. Mike, thank you so much for your patience. You're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. No problem. Uh, pastors, uh, good afternoon to both of you. Thank you. Good uh, afternoon. Got a great great, uh, great show. Uh, my questions came from Bible studies, actually. Yep. I had uh, two quick ones. Daniel 10, yep. uh, where he sees the vision. Is that Christ? And if so, why did he have to wait for Michael the Archangel to take on the, the Prince of Persia? And the second one was, did Judas Iscariot go to heaven or hell because he did fulfill the purposes of God? Okay, well... Oh, I'm sorry. I guess he's going to say he's going to hang up and listen off the air before I cut him off, so I, I, I preempted that. Okay, it's, it's a good point. In Daniel chapter 10, this person was waiting, uh, we're told. You know, the, the prince of Persia was fighting with him mm-hmm. three weeks before the answer to the prayer. If that's the case, that that precludes this being the pre-incarnate Christ, right, mm-hmm. right Greg? Yeah, it would seem that way, yes. Yeah. Now, what's interesting, in some of these issues where an angel of the Lord shows up, we don't know mm-hmm. if it was the pre-incarnate Christ or mm-hmm. a special angel. It's mm-hmm. context 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 driven Mm. there Um, and so we really really don't know Uh, you can make an argument either way on some of these some seem more clear than others but this one in Daniel 10 is is a bit suspect about being the pre-incarnate Christ now Judas Iscariot it was good if that man had never been born Jesus said of him is he going to heaven Greg no no not at all (laughs) I don't think so I mean there are some that we might say well we don't know for sure Uh, Judas no not him yeah the son of perdition yeah uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Satan entered his heart. He betrayed Christ. Uh, he was even given a last chance in the Garden of Gethsemane as he came with those temple guards. And Jesus reached out to him and said, friend, why have you come? Yep. I mean, this is the guy he had already identified as a betrayer in the upper room. Mm-hmm. And yet this creep is coming, you know, to destroy Jesus. And, you know, and now some might say, well, wait a second. Afterwards, Judas you know, was sorrowful. Well, I think he was sorrowful when he realized the full implication of what he had done, but there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Mm-hmm. And there was never repentance. Now, had Judas repented, God would have forgiven him. But it's interesting, you know, in that night, two men walked away. Uh, one yep. denied him, one betrayed him. But one came back, the one who betrayed him, Simon Peter. He returned to the Lord. And th- that's how you can tell who the true believer is from the non-believer who maybe acts like a believer is the true believer will always come back home. They may yep. go astray, but they'll come back home. The non-believer won't because they never were. As John says, loose paraphrase, they went up from us, but if they were really of us, they would have stayed with us. But since they didn't stay with us, it showed they were never of us. And, yep. you know, Judas, I'll tell you what, if we had an award ceremony in the church, we could call it the Judas for best portrayal of a Christian by a non-Christian. Mm-hmm. Give out the Judas Award. Because mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, he fooled everybody. If he yep. was, except Christ, if he was as obvious as people think he was when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, yep. they all would have stood up and pointed and said, it's a guy in the black robe, right? <laughs> he was always lurking in the shadows. We never trusted him. But no one knew it. In fact, they even said no. after Jesus said, one of you will betray me, they said, is it I? Yep. Judas was a really mm-hmm. convincing actor but he didn't fool the Lord. 
Yeah, and also to go on this question to ask Mike, even though he fulfilled what was prophesied, that mm. doesn't mean he was a puppet or a pawn Correct. in the hands of God. He right. could have believed if he chose yes. to, but he never did. In fact, Jesus said, have I not chosen 12 of you and one of you is the devil? Mm-hmm. And then Judas Iscariot went, like we mentioned earlier, to his own place. Right. Uh, he chose, willingly chose. And, and interesting to just as an aside, uh, Peter repented, uh, Judas felt sorry. Two different Greek words, by the way. Mm. Uh, the one used of, of Judas is a little bit weaker, felt sorry but there wasn't a real repentance they're not the same yes. word we translate repent that's good all right we got a, a heaven question here coming up from costa mesa and steve uh, hi steve welcome to pastor's perspective hi, hi. Uh, thank you for having me you're welcome um my question involves the topic of elect and predestination oh. uh-huh. and i i guess my question is did god create certain people to go straight to hell um just because like in john fifteen sixteen, it said jesus said you did not choose me but i chose you and yep. even in ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 he said having predestined us to adoption as mm-hmm. sons by jesus christ so mm-hmm. i don't know that's just kind of been a topic i've been talking about lately and it's kind of wrestling on my heart a little bit so. okay 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 steve, it's stevie not steve i'm sorry we get the get the name right um you got to read john 15 in light of the first 14 chapters of the gospel of okay. john um what came previously there and he's speaking particularly of the apostles he mm-hmm. chose them to be right. part of the 12 that is the context there and in Ephesians I don't mean to steal the question Greg in Ephesians chapter 1 what we're predestined to is to be to the praise of his glory not predestined to salvation so Greg when you preach a gospel message you don't feel well there's some people out there who've got you know the stripe on their back I'm saved the others are lost and you're just Mm -hmm. reeling a man who's already been predetermined how do you feel about that well look here's the thing we we don't know these things you know the Bible does teach predestination okay and it does teach free will sometimes those items those truths are side by side someone once asked i don't even know who was asked virgin maybe um you know how do you reconcile these things he says you don't reconcile friends Mm -hmm. you know so the idea is my job as a preacher is to emphasize the gospel to tell people god loves them to tell people god will forgive them to tell them how to be forgiven and it's god's job to do the saving but I think of that passage in the book of Acts, it says, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Having said that, I do not believe that God predestines a person to go to hell. I reject that outright. Uh, God has not made that choice for a person. It is God's will that all would come to repentance. God has not only that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And nor do I believe in limited atonement. I do not believe that Christ only died for the elect, so-called. I believe he died for the whole world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So I I reject outright, firmly, the idea that people are predestined to hell. There's a choice that we have in the matter, but there's a mystery about this too that we can't Mm -hmm. fully explain, but that we do know we are to call people to Christ and leave the results in the hands of God. I'm reminded of a statement by the great evangelist D.L. Moody, who said, Lord, save the elect and then elect some more. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Thanks, Greg. Paula from Yonkers, New York, is with us now. Thanks for waiting. Paula, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hello, gentlemen, and thank you very much for taking my call. You're welcome. I heard a pastor preach that um, when God told Abraham that he was going to be the father of all nations, it's all nations, the entire uh, population of the world. Is that it? No, many nations, not all nations. In other words, he was he here. What was going on there, Paula? Before Abraham had any children, he was that by faith. Uh, you know, he believed God, but God told him he is going to be the father of many nations, not all nations. Right, Greg? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, and so uh, I see the question: Does that include China, etc.? No, no. And so you heard wrong, or the pa- or maybe you heard right, and the pastor said it wrong, mm-hmm. which is highly possible, right? That uh, uh, someone uh, got excited and and misspoke and said he was going to be the father of all nations, mm-hmm. no, of many nations, Paula. Well, having said that, we could just also say God loves all nations and God certainly loves the people of China and every other nation on the face of the earth and salvation is available to all people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, even though they weren't part of the chosen people. Hey, I wasn't. I'm a Gentile. Me too. And, you know, we've been grafted in 
uh, to the promises of Israel. Maybe we should go to that question about Israel since we're talking about I'm Israel. I'm going but, to that next. You know, we, we've we been grafted into these promises by God. Mm-hmm. And, you know, originally when, when the gospel was going out, the apostles weren't really going to the Gentiles. No, they no. were going uh, to the Israelites and uh, to the Jews. And so the Lord had to redirect them and Remember Peter's vision of that sheet and all those creepy, yep. crawly things that are unclean in the Mosaic Law coming down, and God said, kill and eat. And that was mm-hmm. all going to ultimately result in Peter going to the house of Cornelius uh, to preach the gospel to this outright Gentile. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was being made very clear that uh, this message was for all people. And, you know, speaking of that, of where Peter had the vision, do you remember where it was? Caesarea. Uh, no, that's where he went with the gospel. But Joppa. He was in Joppa. Home and, of Simon the Tanner. Yeah. But he went to Caesarea and explained it to that's Cornelius. That's right. But what's interesting is another guy in Joppa, Jonah, right. didn't want to go to non-Jews and preach exactly. to them either. Uh, the Ninevites, who ended up probably having the biggest revival in human history, coming back to Jonah, who I will be portraying tomorrow night at Hallelujah Night at our church. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it just shows that God loves all people and the gospel is for all people, but clearly... Yeah. The Jews are God's chosen people that he has a special covenant with. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because on our trips to Israel, the first day we're there in Joppa, Joppa, mm-hmm. and that's the thing I go to, Jonah and Acts chapter 10, yeah. both going to Gentiles here yeah. in the Holy Land, and we yeah. being Gentiles are privileged to be a result of that's right. Jonah and Cornelius, right? That's okay, right. great, great. Okay, yeah, Brian's from San Diego. We want to hear his question. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good, thank you, Good. sir. Good. Um, so my question, um, I know it says in the Bible, in the end days, all nations are going to turn against Israel, mm-hmm. pretty much. Um, so I've been in the Marine Corps for about 11 years, and I see our country already kind of starting to turn away from Israel. Mm-hmm. Is it wrong for me to continue serving, or should I think about getting out, or just looking for some advice? Really? No, that's a great question, Brian. It also seems, uh, Greg, that the United States Marine Corps is turning against the United States by, the, the, not from them, but from their leaders dictate yeah. sometimes, too. I mean, a turning away from what God's, uh, you know, what this country was yeah. settled on. So I can imagine Brian and the Marines, you want to serve the country, and you're a hero, Brian, by the way, yeah. anybody in the armed services is, but there is a lack of support for Israel these days, not mm. what the uh, past uh, precedent has been in this country. What mm. do you say to that? Well, it's true. And, of course, that is one of the signs of the end times, that Israel would be isolated. And as we look at the scenario there, I mean, when you look at a superpower like the United Mm. States being an ally of Israel, that's hardly having them stand alone. We know we're going to get there eventually, but I I say let's not rush it. (laughs) Let's do everything we can uh, to try to rectify that. Uh, When we were at Pastor Chuck's tribute service, Don, on Sunday, I had the privilege of talking backstage with a consulate general from Israel Mm. that made some wonderful statements to Chuck, you remember that he said that Chuck was sort of like Jonathan to David exactly. for Israel. And yep. Chuck had been to Israel, was it 60 times? Something like that, yeah. Amazing, you know. Yep. And uh, Chuck was a great lover of Israel. And I, I told the consulate general, I said, you know, you're not going to find a room full of people that love Israel more exactly. than the room you're speaking to tonight. Yep. And I said, because these are not just evangelicals that love Israel. The, these are people that really love Israel. Mm-hmm. Because our pastor taught us that, and we all Indeed. collectively got that memo. We did, and uh, so we talked a little bit. And it's kind of an interesting aside. You know, I, I heard a report on the news that uh, things were getting close to Iran getting that bomb. Yes, a month away. So I thought, who better to ask than this guy right here? You know. So I asked him, and he told me the answer. But he said, if I revealed it, he'd have to shoot me. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm going to share it. No, he didn't say that. Uh, no, he said that they, he believed they were a month away. Yeah. And Israel was taking that very seriously. And and I think it's quite clear that some action is going to have to be taken. And I don't think military action is the only action he implied mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure what that means exactly. But, it, you know, they, they know what's happening. And, you know, some people think Israel might be a little paranoid. But, you know, if if you survived the Holocaust mm. and, and you heard some leaders saying that they wanted to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, I think you'd take it seriously too. 
Yeah. And so we understand that. Yeah, and again, uh, if you those of you who watch us on his channel on Thursday nights at six o'clock Pacific, www.hischannel.com. We've been talking about that, and we're actually we're starting to do daily updates on his channel with Bible prophecy. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the issues we've been hitting, Greg, mm-hmm. because it seems they are close to be able to do that if they wish. Now they also have to develop a mm-hmm. system that deliver it too, which will take mm-hmm. a while. But the actual you know building of a bomb per se yeah. theoretically could be done in a very short period of time, yeah. uh, which means the window is closing. And so if you're going to do something you got to do it sooner rather than later because yeah. there'll come a time where they can't do it i talked to general jerry boykin about mm-hmm. this a while back and you know i just said like technically how would you do it because you yeah. you imagine this stuff being underground under deep concrete yeah. and, and he you know he said it would not be an easy thing to do yeah. but you know i think the israelis probably have thought this too very yeah. carefully and yeah. i'm sure they have a plan but you know we want to just continue to pray for yeah. the nation israel and, and, you know, the Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we know the ultimate answer to that prayer will come when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace himself, returns again. But, folks, this, this really is fulfilled Bible prophecy. Mm-hmm. We're seeing before our eyes. And so we need to continue to pray for that nation. Now, are you going to Jerusalem or Israel again soon as a tour? Next year. You are. Looking what, forward what to month? it. I'm going in the month of May. Really? Leading the tour, and we're we're starting to take sign-ups now. And I, I'll tell you what, I love to go to Israel. I go every two years. And so I, I'm always looking forward to it by the time it rolls around. You know, May's my birthday. It'd be a nice birthday present to take me along sometime. Wow. You know, you, that would be a lot of fun. How about if we did Pastor's Perspective Wild Wednesday would be great. from Jerusalem, be- <laughs> Israel, with falafels? <laughs> with falafels. <laughs> but it wouldn't be a falafel broadcast. we do a good broadcast, yeah. right? Falafel. <laughs> Once again, humor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't know how much. That was pretty good, actually. That one, yeah, it was. I sp- actually sp- like that one. That was <laughs> yeah. better than the other you one. You can use it uh, tomorrow night and claim, that it for, good? Cl- claim it for your Not own. Not that good. <laughs> okay, we got about a minute and a half left before we're out here. Greg, any final thoughts for the people out there? Well, I would just, you know, we've talked about a lot of interesting things today, but uh, our last topic was mm. talking about the end times. Yep. And, you know, when we discuss these things, we're not, we're not taking any delight in the threat of nope. Uh, of an attack against Israel. These are horrifying things, but we're also looking at it through a biblical lens. The Bible tells Mm -hmm. us that these are signs of the time. So what did Jesus say? He said, when you see these things begin to happen, Mm -hmm. look up for your redemption is drawing near. Mm -hmm. We don't know when Christ will come. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 10 years from now. That's up to him. But we do know this much. In the interim, we're to win people to Christ because Mm -hmm. Scripture says God is not willing to do any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and the Lord is not late as some men count lateness. So Mm. it's not that God is late. It's not that Christ is tardy. He's waiting for people to believe. He maybe is even waiting for you to believe. So we hope that you've made that commitment to Christ, and if you haven't, Mm. make it today. Indeed. The gospel is still good news for you out there. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says if you haven't accepted Christ, now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Greg Laurie, thanks for coming on again on Wild Wednesday. Appreciate it. And look forward to next Wednesday and future Wednesdays here on uh, Pastor's Perspective. Pastor Brian will be in with me tomorrow, the good Lord willing, at 3 o'clock Pacific as we again take your calls and questions. The music says... We're out of here. And so thanks again, everybody participate. Those that didn't get on that were waiting, please call back again tomorrow. And we'll take your calls up first. So again, for Pastor Greg, I'm Don Stewart saying goodbye and may the Lord richly Bye-bye. bless. We pray you've been blessed and that you'll join us again for another edition of Pastor's Perspective. The preceding was sponsored by Calvary Chapel and K-Wave.